One of the most interesting ideas I learned from the book Get Good With Money by Tiffany Alice was the concept of financial wholeness. This means being financially complete by taking control of all aspects of our finances. In order to do this, we need to create systems in five different categories. Money management, debt management, investing, wealth protection, aka insurance, and planning our legacy. There are 10 steps to becoming financially whole and have full control over our financial life, which are Step number one, build and automate your budget. Building a budget is not only the first step to financial success, but it can allow you to say yes to many of the things that you want to do. There are a few steps to build a strong budget. First, you start by making a money in list. Here, you take inventory of all of your income. This includes your job, any side hustle or investment income that you have. Then, you make a money out list. Here, you list all of your expenses, even the small ones. Third, you calculate how much these expenses cost you every month. Here, you begin creating a clear picture of how much your current lifestyle is costing you. Fourth, calculate how much you can save every month. Take how much you make and subtract how much you spend every month. If this number is positive, hey, congrats, you are saving money. If this number is negative, we have to do something about it. Fifth, assign control categories to your expenses. Here, you label each expense based on how much control you have over it. For example, your daily Starbucks run would be considered a high control expense, your electric bill would be a medium control expense, and your mortgage would be a low control expense. If your monthly savings are not as high as you would like them to be, then it's time to reduce some of your current expenses, starting with those in the high control categories. Number 7. Separate and organize your funds. Alicia recommends having four different bank accounts, two checking accounts, and two savings accounts. Checking account number one is where all of your funds arrive and get distributed from. Checking account number two is where all of your bills get paid from. Savings account number one is for your emergency savings, and savings account number two is for your long-term savings account. And lastly, you automate your budget. Once you have your account set up, your budgeting process can be automated. You can set up automatic transfers from your main account to the rest of your accounts every month. This way, you don't have to do it. Step number two, organize your savings. Most of us know the importance of saving money since it's the foundation of our financial success, but we need to know how to organize it. There are two main goals we need to have for our savings. First, build an emergency fund. Here, you want to start by putting away three months of your basic living expenses in your first savings account. Ideally, this account would be a credit union, since they normally pay you higher interest rates on your savings, and it is very easy to withdraw your money in case of emergencies. Second, build your long-term savings account. Once you put away at least three months of your basic living expenses, it's time to put money away for the long term on your second savings account. A great idea is to create compartments inside your second savings account to organize your money further. For example, if you want to buy a house in the next few years, inside your second savings account, you can create a money bucket for your home, then create another bucket for your investments, and another one for your yearly vacation. Alicia says that your second savings account could be held in an online bank because they tend to pay the best interest rates on your money and it takes a little longer to withdraw your money, which is an added benefit to control impulse spending. If three months of basic living expenses doesn't feel like enough safety, you can split your savings amount between both of your accounts until you get your emergency fund to six months of living expenses to create even more safety. Step number three, dig out of debt. Debt can be an overwhelming topic for many, but it's a problem that can be easily solved once we have a plan in place. The goal is to identify the best plan to pay down debt, then automate the process. First, we start by identifying your debt. List your debt, how much you owe, minimum payments, interest rates, and any other relevant information. Then, we restructure your debt. The goal for restructuring debt is to help pay off the debt by reducing interest rates and changing loan terms. This can be done by negotiating with credit card companies to lower interest rates, transferring credit card balances to cards with 0% interest, or shopping around for personal loans with lower interest rates than you're currently paying. Now, always do your own research and keep an eye out for transfer fees, hidden charges, and loan terms and conditions. Third, choose a pay-down plan. There are many plans to help you pay down your debt. 
Two of the most popular are the snowball method and the avalanche method. The snowball method focuses on organizing your debts from smallest to biggest and paying off the smallest debts first regardless of interest rates to free up money to add to the next smallest debt and continue to do that until all debts are paid off. The avalanche method focuses on organizing debts from highest interest rates to lowest interest rates and paying off the highest interest rate debt first. Then use that extra money to pay off the next highest interest rate debt until all debts are paid off. And fourth, automate your paydown. Once you've decided which payments go where, automate this process to avoid accidentally forgetting to pay them. Even with automation in place, it's always a good idea to check and make sure your debts are being paid. Step number four, score high with credit. Your credit score is an important part of your financial life. A score between 300 and 580 is considered to be a bad score. A score between 581 and 669 is considered to be a fair score. A score between 670 and 739 is considered to be a good score. A score between 740 and 799 is considered to be a very good score. And a score between 800 and 850 is considered to be an excellent score. Your goal is to get a credit score of 740 or higher by tackling the five factors that make up your score. Number one, payment history. Your payment history makes up for 35% of your score. So making sure that your debts are being paid on time and never missing a payment makes up the biggest impact on your score. Number two, credit utilization. This is how much of your total credit available you are currently using and it makes up for 30% of your score. Alicia says that it's a good idea to keep your utilization under 30% for the best results. Number three, length of credit. This is how long you've used credit for, and it makes up for 15% of your score. This is because lenders trust borrowers with experience managing credit more than those with no experience. Number four, inquiries. Every time you apply for credit, the company will inquire about your credit score from the credit bureaus. This affects your score. There are two types of credit inquiries, soft inquiries and hard inquiries. Soft inquiries do not affect your credit score. Those are inquiries like when you check your credit score or when a credit card company sends you pre-approved offers. Hard inquiries do impact your credit score and it makes up for 10% of your score. These inquiries require your permission to pull and are typically done when you apply for credit. So the goal is to keep these inquiries to a minimum. Number five, credit mix. How many types of credit you are managing also has a small impact on your credit score. Lenders like to see when a borrower has experience managing different types of credit. Now, it's not a good idea to take out different credits just for the sake of boosting your score. Credit should only be taken as needed. This is, as Alicia puts it, the cherry on top of the credit score range. If you're looking to get into the 800 club and can't seem to get there, then you can add a little mix to your credit. Step number five, learn to earn. Up to this point, we've created the foundation of good money habits. Now it's time to take it to a whole nother level. The goal in this step is to focus on increasing your income. It is much easier to follow your budget, save more money, and pay off your debts when you're making more money. Alici goes over four steps to help you increase your income. Number one, maximize your earning potential at work. The goal is to find ways to earn more money without working yourself to the ground. So find out if you're able to get a raise or move up in the company you work in so you can start getting paid more. Number two, assess your skills. Over your lifetime, you've developed a set of skills both in your job and outside your job. Take inventory of all of those skills. Number three, decide which of these skills you can monetize. Out of your list of skills, figure out which of them you can sell to others. For example, if you're an accountant at work, you can start helping small businesses with their bookkeeping. Number four, put a number on it. Figure out what other businesses charge for a similar service and start there. You can modify as you go depending on supply and demand. Step number six, invest like an insider. No financial plan is completed without having your money make more money. When it comes to your investment plan, Alicia says that you should have two investment strategies, a retirement strategy and a wealth strategy. The goal for your retirement strategy is to help you stop working while maintaining your lifestyle. 
the goal for your wealth strategy is to upgrade your life. We'll start with retirement. First, determine how much money you need for retirement. A standard strategy is to multiply your yearly lifestyle cost by 25. So if you spend $65,000 a year, then your goal is to have $1.6 million in order to retire. This is what is called the 4% rule. If you spend 4% or less of your money, you'll likely never run out of money because historically, the market return is 8% yearly. So you'll be living from your interest and not your principal. Second, decide where to put your money. Here, you decide where you will host your investments. The great part is that you can choose more than one. Many people have a combination of a 401k, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, or SEP IRA. Third, choose your investment mix. Here's where you choose what assets go inside your portfolio. Generally, you want to be invested in both stocks and bonds. Stocks give you momentum for growing your investments, but with a little more risk. And bonds give you slow and steady growth with a little more safety. And fourth, set up automation. Once you've calculated how much of your income will go to your retirement, automate it. This way, you've built a system that will take care of your retirement for you. Step number seven, get good with insurance. You've worked really hard at this point to create a great financial plan. The last thing you'd want is to have an unexpected emergency take it all down. So understanding insurance will protect your money from those unexpected circumstances looking to take your money. There are three main categories of insurance to look into. Health insurance, life insurance, and disability insurance. Health insurance allows you to reduce any major medical bills that you might get in the case of a medical emergency. Life insurance is a contract between you and the insurance company where you pay a premium every month and in exchange, they will pay a predetermined lump sum payment to your loved ones in the case you pass away, regardless of how much money you've actually paid in premiums. And disability insurance allows you to insure your income if any disability happens in the future. Step number eight, increase your net worth. Your net worth is like a temperature check when you go to the doctor. It gives you a good overview of the health of your financial life. To calculate your net worth, you take the value of all of the assets you own and subtract all the liabilities you have. This will give you your net worth. Your net worth doesn't necessarily represent your income, but instead your financial habits. There can be people out there that make more money but might have lower net worths if they have too many liabilities and not enough assets. Next, you want to come to terms with your net worth, at least for now, because in many cases, this number can be negative if we have too many liabilities. Then, it's time to increase our net worth. This is focusing on reducing our liabilities and avoiding collecting more as we divert more money into assets to develop a stronger net worth. Step number nine, build your money team. Alici says that everyone needs a money team. This team will depend on your situation. If your finances are fairly simple, this can be your partner, your peers, and your financial advisor. As your finances get more complex, your team might grow as well. But Alice recommends five people to have in your money team as a good foundation. First, you want to have an accountability partner, a financial advisor, a certified public accountant, an estate planning attorney, and an insurance broker. As your finances grow and change, you can add people to your team to keep your money protected and help you make good decisions. Step number 10, leave a legacy. The last step of your financial plan is to create arrangements for when you're no longer here. There are two main types of arrangements for your legacy, a will and a living trust. A will is a legal document that goes into effect when you die. A living trust is a legal entity that allows you to begin the process of transferring assets and benefits to your loved ones as soon as it's signed, so it can happen while you're still alive. Having a plan will make it much easier to develop wealth, but is your mindset in the right place? If you want to develop a healthy mindset around money, check out this video on the book The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And as always, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.